Chapter 14 of Christ's Object Lessons. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Russell Newton. Christ's Object Lessons by Ellen G. White. Chapter 14. Christ had been speaking of the period just before his second coming, and of the perils through which his followers must pass. With special reference to that time, he related the parable, to this end, that men ought always to pray and not to faint. There was in a city, he said, a judge, which feared not God, neither regarded man. And there was a widow in that city. And she came unto him, saying, Avenge me of mine adversary. And he would not for a while. But afterward he said within himself, Though I fear not God, nor regard man, yet because this widow troubleth me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she weary me. And the Lord said, Hear what the unjust judge saith. And shall not God avenge his own elect, which cry day and night unto him, though he bear long with them? I tell you, that he will avenge them speedily. The judge who is here pictured had no regard for right, nor pity for suffering. The widow who pressed her case before him was persistently repulsed. Again and again she came to him, only to be treated with contempt and to be driven from the judgment seat. The judge knew that her cause was righteous, and he could have relieved her at once, but he would not. He wanted to show his arbitrary power, and it gratified him to let her ask and plead and entreat in vain. But she would not fail nor become discouraged. Notwithstanding his indifference and hard-heartedness, she pressed her petition until the judge consented to attend to her case. Though I fear not God, nor regard man, he said, yet because this widow troubleth me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she weary me. To save his reputation, to avoid giving publicity to his partial, one-sided judgment, he avenged the persevering woman. And the Lord said, Hear what the unjust judge saith, and shall not God avenge his own elect, which cry day and night unto him, though he bear long with them? I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Christ here draws a sharp contrast between the unjust judge and God. The judge yielded to the widow's request merely through selfishness, that he might be relieved of her importunity. He felt for her no pity or compassion. Her misery was nothing to him. How different is the attitude of God toward those who seek him! The appeals of the needy and distressed are considered by him with infinite compassion. The woman who entreated the judge for justice had lost her husband by death. Poor and friendless, she had no means of retrieving her ruined fortunes. So by sin man lost his connection with God. Of himself he has no means of salvation. But in Christ we are brought nigh unto the Father. The elect of God are dear to his heart. They are those who he has called out of darkness into his marvelous light, to show forth his praise, to shine as lights amid the darkness of the world. The unjust judge had no special interest in the widow who importuned him for deliverance, yet in order to rid himself of her pitiful appeals, he heard her plea, and delivered her from her adversary. But God loves his children with infinite love. To him the dearest object on earth is his church. For the Lord's portion is his people. Jacob is the lot of his inheritance. He found him in a desert land and in the waste howling wilderness. He led him about, he instructed him, he kept him as the apple of his eye. For thus saith the Lord of hosts, After the glory hath he sent me unto the nations which spoiled you, for he that toucheth you toucheth the apple of his eye. The widow's prayer, Avenge me, do me justice of mine adversary, represents the prayer of God's children. Satan is their great adversary. He is the accuser of our brethren, who accuses them before God day and night. He is continually working to misrepresent and accuse, to deceive and destroy the people of God. And as for deliverance for the power of Satan and his agents that in this parable Christ teaches his disciples to pray. In the prophecy of Zechariah is brought to view Satan's accusing work, and the work of Christ in resisting the adversary of his people. The prophet says, he showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right hand to resist him. And the Lord said unto Satan, The Lord rebuke thee, O Satan, even the Lord that hath chosen Jerusalem rebuke thee. Is not this a brand plucked out of the fire? Now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments, and stood before the angel. The people of God are here represented as a criminal on trial. Joshua, as high priest, is seeking for a blessing for his people who are in great affliction. While he is pleading before God, 
Satan is standing at his right hand as his adversary. He is accusing the children of God and making their case appear as desperate as possible. He presents before the Lord their evil doings and their defects. He shows their faults and failures, hoping they will appear of such a character in the eyes of Christ that he will render them no help in their great need. Joshua, as the representative of God's people, stands under condemnation clothed with filthy garments. Aware of the sins of his people, he is weighed down with discouragement. Satan is pressing upon his soul a sense of guiltiness that makes him feel almost helpless. Yet there he stands as a suppliant, with Satan arrayed against him. The work of Satan as an accuser began in heaven. This has been his work on earth ever since man's fall, and it will be his work in a special sense as we approach nearer to the close of this world's history. As he sees that his time is short, he will work with greater earnestness to deceive and destroy. He is angry when he sees a people on the earth who, even in their weakness and sinfulness, have respect to the law of Jehovah. He is determined that they shall not obey God. He delights in their unworthiness, and has devices prepared for every soul, that all may be ensnared and separated from God. He seeks to accuse and condemn God and all who strive to carry out his purposes in this world, in mercy and love, in compassion and forgiveness. Every manifestation of God's power for his people arouses the enmity of Satan. Every time God works in their behalf, Satan with his angels works with renewed vigor to compass their ruin. He is jealous of all who make Christ their strength. His object is to instigate evil, and when he has succeeded, throw all the blame upon the tempted ones. He points to their filthy garments, their defective characters. He presents their weakness and folly, their sins of ingratitude, their unlikeness to Christ, which has dishonored their Redeemer. All this he urges as an argument proving his right to work his will in their destruction. He endeavors to affright their souls with the thought that their case is hopeless, that the stain of their defilement can never be washed away. He hopes so to destroy their faith that they will yield fully to his temptations and turn from their allegiance to God. The Lord's people cannot of themselves answer the charges of Satan. As they look to themselves, they are ready to despair. But they appeal to the divine advocate. They plead the merits of the Redeemer. God can be just, and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. With confidence the Lord's children cry unto him to silence the accusations of Satan, and bring to naught his devices. Do me justice of mine adversary, they pray, and with the mighty argument of the cross, Christ silences the bold accuser. The Lord said unto Satan, The Lord rebuke thee, O Satan, even the Lord that hath chosen Jerusalem rebuke thee. Is this not a brand plucked out of the fire? When Satan seeks to cover the people of God with blackness and ruin them, Christ interposes. Although they have sinned, Christ has taken the guilt of their sins upon his own soul. He has snatched the race as a brand from the fire. By his human nature he is linked with man, while through his divine nature he is one with the infinite God. Help is brought within the reach of perishing souls. The adversary is rebuked. Now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments, and stood before the angel, and he answered and spake unto those that stood before him, saying, Take away the filthy garments from him. And unto him he said, Behold, I have caused thine iniquity to pass from me, and I will clothe thee with change of raiment. And I said, Let them set a fair mitre upon his head. So they set a fair mitre upon his head and clothed him with garments. Then, with the authority of the Lord of hosts, the angel made a solemn pledge to Joshua, the representative of God's people. If thou wilt walk in my ways, and if thou wilt keep my charge, then thou shalt also judge my house, and shalt also keep my courts, and I will give thee places to walk among these that stand by, even among the angels that surround the throne of God. Notwithstanding the defects of the people of God, Christ does not turn away from the objects of his care. He has the power to change their raiment. He removes the filthy garments. He places upon the repenting, believing ones his own robe of righteousness, and writes pardon against their names on the records of heaven. He confesses them as his before the heavenly universe. Satan, their adversary, is shown to be an accuser and deceiver. God will do justice for his own elect. The prayer, Do me justice of mine adversary, applies not only to Satan, but to the agency whom he instigates to misrepresent, to tempt, and to destroy the people of God. 
those who have decided to obey the commandments of god will understand by experience that they have adversaries who are controlled by a power from beneath such adversaries beset christ at every step how constantly and determinedly no human being can ever know christ's disciples like their master are followed by continual temptation the scriptures describe the condition of the world just before christ's second coming james the apostle pictures the greed and oppression that will prevail he says go to now ye rich men ye have heaped treasure together for the last days behold the hire of the laborers who have reaped down your fields which is of you kept back by fraud crieth and the cries of them which have reaped are entered into the ears of the lord of sabaoth ye have lived in pleasure on the earth and been wanton ye have nourished your hearts as in a day of slaughter ye have condemned and killed the just and he doth not resist you this is a picture of what exists today by every species of oppression and extortion men are piling up colossal fortunes while the cries of starving humanity are coming up before god judgment is turned away backward and justice standeth afar off for truth is fallen in the street and equity cannot enter yea truth faileth and he that departeth from evil maketh himself a prey this was fulfilled in the life of christ on earth he was loyal to god's commandments setting aside the human traditions and requirements which had been exalted in their place because of this he was hated and persecuted this history is repeated the laws and traditions of men are exalted above the law of god and those who are true to god's commandments suffer reproach and persecution christ because of his faithfulness to god was accused as a sabbath breaker and blasphemer he was declared to be possessed of a devil and denounced as beelzebub in like manner his followers are accused and misrepresented thus satan hopes to lead them to sin and cast dishonor upon god the character of the judge in the parable who feared not god nor regarded man was presented by christ to show the kind of judgment that was then being executed and that would soon be witnessed at his trial he desires his people in all time to realize how little dependence can be placed on earthly rulers or judges in the day of adversity often the elect people of god have to stand before men in official positions who do not make the word of god their guide and counselor but who follow their own unconsecrated undisciplined impulses in the parable of the unjust judge christ has shown what we should do shall not god avenge his own elect which cry day and night unto him christ our example did nothing to vindicate or deliver himself he committed his case to god so his followers are not to accuse or condemn or to resort to force in order to deliver themselves when trials arise that seem unexplainable we should not allow our peace to be spoiled however unjustly we may be treated let not passion arise by indulging a spirit of retaliation we injure ourselves we destroy our own confidence in god and grieve the holy spirit there is by our side a witness a heavenly messenger who will lift up for us a standard against the enemy he will shut us in with the bright beams of the sun of righteousness beyond this satan cannot penetrate he cannot pass this shield of holy light while the world is progressing in wickedness none of us need flatter ourselves that we shall have no difficulties but it is these very difficulties that bring us into the audience chamber of the most high we may seek counsel of one who is infinite in wisdom the lord says call upon me in the day of trouble he invites us to present to him our perplexities and necessities and our need of divine help he bids us to be instant in prayer as soon as difficulties arise we are to offer him our sincere earnest petitions by our importunate prayers we give evidence of our strong confidence in god the sense of our need leads us to pray earnestly and our heavenly father is moved by our supplications often those who suffer reproach and persecution for their faith are tempted to think themselves forsaken by god in the eyes of men they are in the minority to all appearance their enemies triumph over them but let them not violate their conscience he who has suffered in their behalf and has borne their sorrows and afflictions has not forsaken them the children of god are not left alone and defenseless prayer moves the arm of omnipotence prayer has subdued kingdoms wrought righteousness obtained promises 
stop the mouths of lions, quench the violence of fire. We shall know what this means when we hear the reports of the martyrs who died for their faith. Turn to flight the armies of the aliens. If we surrender our lives to his service, we can never be placed in a position for which God has not made provision. Whatever may be our situation, we have a guide to direct our way. Whatever our perplexities, we have a sure counselor. Whatever our sorrow, bereavement, or loneliness, we have a sympathizing friend. If in our ignorance we make missteps, Christ does not leave us. His voice, clear and distinct, is heard, saying, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He shall deliver the needy when he crieth, the poor also, and him that hath no helper. The Lord declares that he will be honored by those who draw nigh to him, who faithfully do his service. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusteth in thee. The arm of omnipotence is outstretched to lead us onward and still onward. Go forward, the Lord says. I will send you help. It is for my name's glory that you ask and you shall receive. I will be honored before those who are watching for your failure. They shall see my word triumph gloriously. All things whatsoever ye shall ask in prayer, believing, ye shall receive. Let all who are afflicted or unjustly used cry to God. Turn away from those whose hearts are as steel, and make your request known to your Maker. Never is one repulsed who comes to him with a contrite heart. Not one sincere prayer is lost. Amid the anthems of the celestial choir, God hears the cries of the weakest human being. We pour out our heart's desire in our closets. We breathe a prayer as we walk by the way, and our words reach the throne of the monarch of the universe. They may be inaudible to any human ear, but they cannot die away into silence, nor can they be lost through the activities of business that are going on. Nothing can drown the soul's desire. It rises above the din of the street, above the confusion of the multitude, to the heavenly courts. It is God to whom we are speaking, and our prayer is heard. You who feel the most unworthy, fear not to commit your case to God. When he gave himself to Christ for the sin of the world, he undertook the case of every soul. He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Will he not fulfill the gracious word given for our encouragement and strength? Christ desires nothing so much as to redeem his heritage from the dominion of Satan. But before we are delivered from Satan's power without, we must be delivered from his power within. The Lord permits trials in order that we may be cleansed from earthliness, from selfishness, from harsh, unchristlike traits of character. He suffers the deep waters of affliction to go over our souls in order that we may know him, and Jesus Christ whom he has sent in order that we may have deep heart longings to be cleansed from defilement and may come forth from the trial purer, holier, happier. Often we enter the furnace of trial with our souls darkened with selfishness. But if patient under the crucial test, we shall come forth reflecting the divine character. When his purpose in the affliction is accomplished, he shall bring forth thy righteousness as the light and thy judgment as the noonday. There is no danger that the Lord will neglect the prayers of his people. The danger is that in temptation and trial they will become discouraged and fail to persevere in prayer. The Savior manifested divine compassion toward the Syrophoenician woman. His heart was touched as he saw her grief. He longed to give her an immediate assurance that her prayer was heard, but he desired to teach his disciples a lesson, and for a time he seemed to neglect the cry of her tortured heart. When her faith had been made manifest, he spoke to her words of commendation and sent her away with the precious boon she had asked. The disciples never forgot this lesson, and it is placed on record to show the result of persevering prayer. It was Christ himself who put into that mother's heart the persistence which would not be repulsed. It was Christ who gave the pleading widow courage and determination before the judge. It was Christ who, centuries before, in the mysterious conflict by the Jabbok, had inspired Jacob with the same persevering faith, and the confidence which he himself had implanted, he did not fail to reward. He who dwells in the heavenly sanctuary judges righteously. 
His pleasure is more in his people, struggling with temptation in a world of sin, than in the host of angels that surround his throne. In this speck of a world, the whole heavenly universe manifests the greatest interest, for Christ has paid an infinite price for the souls of its inhabitants. The world's Redeemer has bound earth to heaven by ties of intelligence, for the redeemed of the Lord are here. Heavenly beings still visit the earth, as in the days when they walked and talked with Abraham and with Moses. Amid the busy activity of our great cities, amid the multitudes that crown the thoroughfares and fill the marts of trade, where from morning till evening the people act as if business and sport and pleasure were all there is to life, where there are so few to contemplate unseen realities. Even here heaven has still its watchers and its holy ones. They are invisible agencies observing every word and deed of human beings. In every assembly for business or pleasure, in every gathering for worship, there are more listeners than can be seen with the natural sight. Sometimes the heavenly intelligences draw aside the curtain which hides the unseen world, that our thoughts may be withdrawn from the hurry and rush of life to consider that there are unseen witnesses to all we do or say. We need to understand better than we do the mission of the angel visitants. It would be well to consider that in all our work we have the cooperation and care of heavenly beings. Invisible armies of light and power attend the meek and lowly ones who believe and claim the promises of God. Cherubim and seraphim and angels that excel in strength, ten thousand times ten thousand and thousands of thousands, stand at his right hand, all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation. By these angel messengers a faithful record is kept of the words and deeds of the children of men. Every act of cruelty or injustice toward God's people, all they are caused to suffer through the power of evil workers, is registered in heaven. Shall not God avenge his own elect, which cry day and night unto him, though he bear long with them? I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Cast not away therefore your confidence, which hath great recompense of reward. For ye have need of patience, that, after ye have done the will of God, ye might receive the promise. For yet a little while, and he that shall come, will come, and will not tarry. Behold, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth, and hath long patience for it, until he receive the early and latter rain. Be ye also patient, Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. The long-suffering of God is wonderful. Long does justice wait while mercy pleads with the sinner. But righteousness and judgment are the establishment of his throne. The Lord is slow to anger, but he is great in power, and will not at all acquit the wicked. The Lord hath his way in the whirlwind and in the storm, and the clouds are the dust of his feet." The world has become bold in transgression of God's law. Because of his long forbearance, men have trampled upon his authority. They have strengthened one another in oppression and cruelty toward his heritage, saying, How doth God know? And is there knowledge in the Most High? But there is a line beyond which they cannot pass. The time is near when they will have reached the prescribed limit. Even now they have almost exceeded the bounds of the long-suffering of God, the limits of his grace the limits of his mercy. The Lord will interpose to vindicate his own honor, to deliver his people, and to repress the swellings of unrighteousness. In Noah's day, men had disregarded the law of God until almost all remembrance of the Creator had passed away from the earth. Their iniquity reached so great a height that the Lord brought a flood of waters upon the earth and swept away its wicked inhabitants. From age to age the Lord has made known the manner of his working, when a crisis has come, he has revealed himself, and has interposed to hinder the working out of Satan's plans. With nations, with families, and with individuals, he has often permitted matters to come to a crisis, that his interference might become marked. Then he has made manifest that there is a God in Israel who will maintain his law and vindicate his people. In this time of prevailing iniquity, we may know that the last great crisis is at hand when the defiance of God's law is almost universal, when his people are oppressed and afflicted by their fellow men, the Lord will interpose. The time is near when he will say, Come, my people, enter thou into thy chambers, and shut thy doors about thee. Hide thyself, as it were for a little moment, 
until the indignation be overpassed. For, behold, the Lord cometh out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity. The earth also shall disclose her blood, and shall no more cover her slain. Men who claim to be Christians may now defraud and oppress the poor. They may rob the widow and the fatherless. They may indulge their satanic hatred, because they cannot control the consciences of God's people. But for all this, God will bring them into judgment. They shall have judgment without mercy, that have showed no mercy. Not long hence, they will stand before the judge of all the earth, to render an account for the pain they have caused to the bodies and souls of his heritage. They may now indulge in false accusations. They may deride those who God has appointed to do his work. They may consign his believing ones to prison, to the chain-gang, to banishment, to death. But for every pang of anguish, every tear shed, they must answer. God will reward them double for their sins. Concerning Babylon, the symbol of the apostate church, he says to his ministers of judgment, Her sins have reached unto heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. Reward her, even as she rewarded you, and double unto her double according to her works. In the cup which she hath filled, fill to her double. From India, from Africa, from China, from the islands of the sea, from the downtrodden millions of so-called Christian lands, the cry of human woe is ascending to God. That cry will not long be unanswered. God will cleanse the earth from its moral corruption, not by a sea of water as in Noah's day, but by a sea of fire that cannot be quenched by any human devising. There shall be a time of trouble, such as never was since there was a nation even to that same time, and at that time thy people shall be delivered, and every one that shall be found written in the book. From garrets, from hovels, from dungeons, from scaffolds, from mountains and deserts, from the caves of the earth and the caverns of the sea, Christ will gather his children to himself. On earth they have been destitute, afflicted, and tormented. Millions have gone down to the grave loaded with infamy because they refused to yield to the deceptive claims of Satan. By human tribunals, the children of God had been adjudged the vilest of criminals. But the day is near when God is judge himself. Then the decisions of earth shall be reversed. The rebuke of his people shall he take away. White robes will be given to every one of them, and they shall call them the holy people, the redeemed of the Lord. Whatever crosses they have been called to bear, whatever losses they have sustained, whatever persecution they have suffered, even to the loss of their temporal life, the children of God are amply recompensed. They shall see his face, and his name shall be in their foreheads. Behold, the husbandman watcheth for the precious fruit of the earth, and hath long patience for it, until he receive the early and latter rain. End of chapter 14Chapter 15 of Christ's Object Lessons. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by J. L. Baldwin. Christ's Object Lessons by Ellen G. White. Chapter 15 This Man Receiveth Sinners. As the publicans and sinners gathered about Christ, the rabbis expressed their displeasure. This man receiveth sinners, they said, and eateth with them. By this accusation they insinuated that Christ liked to associate with the sinful and vile and was insensible to their wickedness. The rabbis had been disappointed in Jesus. Why was it that one who claimed so lofty a character did not mingle with them and follow their methods of teaching? Why did he go about so unpretendingly, working among all classes? If he were a true prophet, they said, he would harmonize with them, and would treat the publicans and sinners with the indifference they deserved. It angered these guardians of society that he with whom they were continually in controversy, yet whose purity of life awed and condemned them, should meet in such apparent sympathy with social outcasts. They did not approve of his methods. They regarded themselves as educated, refined, and preeminently religious, but Christ's example laid bare their selfishness. It angered them also that those who showed only contempt for the rabbis and who were never seen in the synagogues should flock about Jesus and listen with rapt attention to his words. 
the scribes and pharisees felt only condemnation in that pure presence how was it then that publicans and sinners were drawn to jesus they knew not that the explanation lay in the very words they had uttered as a scornful charge this man receiveth sinners the souls who came to jesus felt in his presence that even for them there was escape from the pit of sin the pharisees had only scorn and condemnation for them but christ greeted them as children of god estranged indeed from the father's house but not forgotten by the father's heart and their very misery and sin made them only the more the objects of his compassion the farther they had wandered from him the more earnest the longing and the greater the sacrifice for their rescue all this the teachers of israel might have learned from the sacred scrolls of which it was their pride to be the keepers and expounders had not david written david who had fallen into deadly sin i have gone astray like a lost sheep seek thy servant had not micah revealed god's love to the sinner saying who is a god like unto thee that pardoneth iniquity and passeth by the transgression of the remnant of his heritage he retaineth not his anger for ever because he delighteth in mercy the lost sheep christ did not at this time remind his hearers of the words of scripture he appealed to the witness of their own experience the wide-spreading table-lands on the east of jordan afforded abundant pasturage for flocks and through the gorges and over the wooded hills had wandered many a lost sheep to be searched for and brought back by the shepherd's care in the company about jesus there were shepherds and also men who had money invested in flocks and herds and all could appreciate his illustration what man of you having an hundred sheep if he lose one of them doth not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness and go after that which is lost until he find it these souls whom you despise said jesus are the property of god by creation and by redemption they are his and they are of value in his sight as the shepherd loves his sheep and cannot rest if even one be missing so in an infinitely higher degree does god love every outcast soul men may deny the claim of his love they may wander from him they may choose another master yet they are gods and he longs to recover his own he says as a shepherd seeketh out his flock in the day that he is among his sheep that are scattered so will i seek out my sheep and will deliver them out of all places where they have been scattered in the cloudy and dark day in the parable the shepherd goes out to search for one sheep the very least that can be numbered so if there had been but one lost soul christ would have died for that one the sheep that has strayed from the fold is the most helpless of all creatures it must be sought for by the shepherd for it cannot find its way back so with the soul that has wandered away from god he is as helpless as the lost sheep and unless divine love had come to his rescue he could never find his way to god the shepherd who discovers that one of his sheep is missing does not look carelessly upon the flock that is safely housed and say i have ninety and nine and it will cost me too much trouble to go in search of the straying one let him come back and i will open the door of the sheepfold and let him in no no sooner does the sheep go astray than the shepherd is filled with grief and anxiety he counts and recounts his flock when he is sure that one sheep is lost he slumbers not he leaves the ninety and nine within the fold and goes in search of the straying sheep the darker and more tempestuous the night and the more perilous the way the greater is the shepherd's anxiety and the more earnest his search he makes every effort to find that one lost sheep with what relief he hears in the distance its first faint cry following the sound he climbs the steepest heights he goes to the very edge of the precipice at the risk of his own life thus he searches while the cry growing fainter tells him that his sheep is ready to die at last his effort is rewarded the lost is found then he does not scold it because it has caused him so much trouble he does not drive it with a whip he does not even try to lead it home in his joy he takes the trembling creature upon his shoulders if it is bruised and wounded he gathers it in his arms pressing it close to his bosom that the warmth of his own heart may give it life with gratitude that his search has not been in vain he bears it back to the fold thank god he has presented to our imagination no picture of a sorrowful shepherd returning without the sheep the parable does not speak of failure but of success and joy in the recovery here is the divine guarantee that not even one of the straying sheep of god's fold is overlooked not one is left unsuccored 
every one that will submit to be ransomed christ will rescue from the pit of corruption and from the briars of sin desponding soul take courage even though you have done wickedly do not think that perhaps god will pardon your transgressions and permit you to come into his presence god has made the first advance while you were in rebellion against him he went forth to seek you with the tender heart of the shepherd he left the ninety and nine and went out into the wilderness to find that which was lost the soul bruised and wounded and ready to perish he encircles in his arms of love and joyfully bears it to the fold of safety it was taught by the jews that before god's love is extended to the sinner he must first repent in their view repentance is a work by which men earn the favor of heaven and it was this thought that led the pharisees to exclaim in astonishment and anger this man receiveth sinners according to their ideas he should permit none to approach him but those who had repented but in the parable of the lost sheep christ teaches that salvation does not come through our seeking after god but through god seeking after us there is none that understandeth there is none that seeketh after god they are all gone out of the way we do not repent in order that god may love us but he reveals to us his love in order that we may repent when the straying sheep is at last brought home the shepherd's gratitude finds expression in melodious songs of rejoicing he calls upon his friends and neighbors saying unto them rejoice with me for i have found my sheep which was lost so when a wanderer is found by the great shepherd of the sheep heaven and earth unite in thanksgiving and rejoicing joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth more than over ninety and nine just persons which need no repentance you pharisees said christ regard yourselves as the favorites of heaven you think yourselves secure in your own righteousness know then that if you need no repentance my mission is not to you these poor souls who feel their poverty and sinfulness are the very ones whom i have come to rescue angels of heaven are interested in these lost ones whom you despise you complain and sneer when one of these souls joins himself to me but know that angels rejoice and the song of triumph rings through the courts above the rabbis had a saying that there is rejoicing in heaven when one who has sinned against god is destroyed but jesus taught that to god the work of destruction is a strange work that in which all heaven delights is the restoration of god's own image in the souls whom he has made when one who has wandered far in sin seeks to return to god he will encounter criticism and distrust there are those who will doubt whether his repentance is genuine or will whisper he has no stability i do not believe that he will hold out these persons are doing not the work of god but the work of satan who is the accuser of the brethren through their criticisms the wicked one hopes to discourage that soul and to drive him still farther from hope and from god let the repenting sinner contemplate the rejoicing of heaven over the return of the one that was lost let him rest in the love of god and in no case be disheartened by the scorn and suspicion of the pharisees the rabbis understood christ's parable as applying to the publicans and sinners but it has also a wider meaning by the lost sheep christ represents not only the individual sinner but the one world that has apostatized and has been ruined by sin this world is but an atom in the vast dominions over which god presides yet this little fallen world the one lost sheep is more precious in his sight than are the ninety and nine that went not astray from the fold christ the loved commander in the heavenly courts stooped from his high estate laid aside the glory that he had with the father in order to save the one lost world for this he left the sinless worlds on high the ninety and nine that loved him and came to this earth to be wounded for our transgressions and bruised for our iniquities god gave himself in his son that he might have the joy of receiving back the sheep that was lost behold what manner of love the father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of god and christ says as thou hast sent me into the world even so have i also sent them into the world to fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of christ for his body's sake which is the church every soul whom christ has rescued is called to work in his name for the saving of the lost this work had been neglected in israel is it not neglected to-day by those who profess to be christ's followers how many of the wandering ones have you reader sought for and brought back to the fold when you turn from those who seem unpromising and unattractive do you realize that you are neglecting the souls for whom christ is seeking 
at the very time when you turn from them they may be in the greatest need of your compassion in every assembly for worship there are souls longing for rest and peace they may appear to be living careless lives but they are not insensible to the influence of the holy spirit many among them might be won for christ if the lost sheep is not brought back to the fold it wanders until it perishes and many souls go down to ruin for want of a hand stretched out to save these erring ones may appear hard and reckless but if they had received the same advantages that others have had they might have revealed far more nobility of soul and greater talent for usefulness angels pity these wandering ones angels weep while human eyes are dry and hearts are closed to pity oh the lack of deep soul-touching sympathy for the tempted and the erring oh for more of christ's spirit and for less far less of self the pharisees understood christ's parable as a rebuke to them instead of accepting their criticism of his work he had reproved their neglect of the publicans and sinners he had not done this openly lest it should close their hearts against him but his illustration set before them the very work which god required of them and which they had failed to do had they been true shepherds these leaders in israel would have done the work of a shepherd they would have manifested the mercy and love of christ and would have united with him in his mission their refusal to do this had proved their claims of piety to be false now many rejected christ's reproof yet to some his words brought conviction upon these after christ's ascension to heaven the holy spirit came and they united with his disciples in the very work outlined in the parable of the lost sheep the lost piece of silver after giving the parable of the lost sheep christ spoke another saying what woman having ten pieces of silver if she lose one piece doth not light a candle and sweep the house and seek diligently till she find it in the east the houses of the poor usually consisted of but one room often windowless and dark the room was rarely swept and a piece of money falling on the floor would be speedily covered by dust and rubbish in order that it might be found even in the daytime a candle must be lighted and the house must be swept diligently the wife's marriage portion usually consisted of pieces of money which she carefully preserved as her most cherished possession to be transmitted to her own daughters the loss of one of these pieces would be regarded as a serious calamity and its recovery would cause great rejoicing in which the neighboring women would readily share when she hath found it christ said she calleth her friends and her neighbors together saying rejoice with me for i have found the peace which i had lost likewise i say unto you there is joy in the presence of the angels of god over one sinner that repenteth this parable like the preceding sets forth the loss of something which with proper search may be recovered and that with great joy but the two parables represent different classes the lost sheep knows that it is lost it has left the shepherd and the flock and it cannot recover itself it represents those who realize that they are separated from god and who are in a cloud of perplexity in humiliation and sorely tempted the lost coin represents those who are lost in trespasses and sins but who have no sense of their condition they are estranged from god but they know it not their souls are in peril but they are unconscious and unconcerned in this parable christ teaches that even those who are indifferent to the claims of god are the objects of his pitying love they are to be sought for that they may be brought back to god the sheep wandered away from the fold it was lost in the wilderness or upon the mountains the piece of silver was lost in the house it was close at hand yet it could be recovered only by diligent search this parable has a lesson to families in the household there is often great carelessness concerning the souls of its members among their number may be one who is estranged from god but how little anxiety is felt lest in the family relationship there be lost one of god's entrusted gifts the coin though lying among dust and rubbish is a piece of silver still its owner seeks it because it is of value so every soul however degraded by sin is in god's sight accounted precious as the coin bears the image and superscription of the reigning power so man at his creation bore the image and superscription of god and though now marred and dim through the influence of sin the traces of this inscription remain upon every soul god desires to recover that soul and to retrace upon it his own image in righteousness and holiness the woman in the parable searches diligently for her lost coin 
She lights the candle and sweeps the house. She removes everything that might obstruct her search. Though only one piece is lost, she will not cease her efforts until that piece is found. So in the family, if one member is lost to God, every means should be used for his recovery. On the part of all the others, let there be diligent, careful self-examination. Let the life practice be investigated. See if there is not some mistake, some error in management, by which that soul is confirmed in impenitence. If there is in the family one child who is unconscious of his sinful state, parents should not rest. Let the candle be lighted. Search the word of God, and by its light let everything in the home be diligently examined, to see why this child is lost. Let parents search their own hearts, examine their habits and practices. Children are the heritage of the Lord, and we are answerable to him for our management of his property. There are fathers and mothers who long to labor in some foreign mission field. There are many who are active in Christian work outside the home, while their own children are strangers to the Savior and his love. The work of winning their children for Christ many parents trust to the minister or the Sabbath school teacher, but in doing this they are neglecting their own God-given responsibility. The education and training of their children to be Christians is the highest service that parents can render to God. It is a work that demands patient labor, a lifelong diligent and persevering effort. By a neglect of this trust we prove ourselves unfaithful stewards. No excuse for such neglect will be accepted by God. But those who have been guilty of neglect are not to despair. The woman whose coin was lost searched until she found it. So in love, faith, and prayer let parents work for their households, until with joy they can come to God, saying, Behold, I am the children whom the Lord hath given me. This is true home missionary work, and it is as helpful to those who do it as to those for whom it is done. By our faithful interest for the home circle, we are fitting ourselves to work for the members of the Lord's family, with whom, if loyal to Christ, we shall live through eternal ages. For our brethren and sisters in Christ, we are to show the same interest that as members of one family we have for one another. And God designs that all this shall fit us to labor for still others. As our sympathies shall broaden and our love increase, we shall find everywhere a work to do. God's great human household embraces the world, and none of its members are to be passed by with neglect. Wherever we may be, there the lost piece of silver awaits our search. Are we seeking for it? Day by day we meet with those who take no interest in religious things. We talk with them, we visit among them. Do we show an interest in their spiritual welfare? Do we present Christ to them as the sin-pardoning Savior? With our own hearts warm with the love of Christ, do we tell them about that love? If we do not, how shall we meet these souls, lost, eternally lost, when with them we stand before the throne of God? the value of a soul who can estimate. Would you know its worth? Go to Gethsemane, and there watch with Christ through those hours of anguish, when he sweat as it were great drops of blood. Look upon the Saviour uplifted on the cross. Hear that despairing cry, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Look upon the wounded head, the pierced side, the marred feet. Remember that Christ risked all. For our redemption, heaven itself was imperiled. At the foot of the cross, remembering that for one sinner Christ would have laid down his life, you may estimate the value of a soul. If you are in communion with Christ, you will place his estimate upon every human being. You will feel for others the same deep love that Christ has felt for you. Then you will be able to win, not drive, to attract, not repulse, those for whom he died. None would ever have been brought back to God if Christ had not made a personal effort for them and it is by this personal work that we can rescue souls. When you see those who are going down to death, you will not rest in quiet indifference and ease. The greater their sin and the deeper their misery, the more earnest and tender will be your efforts for their recovery. You will discern the need of those who are suffering, who have been sinning against God, and who are oppressed with a burden of guilt. Your heart will go out in sympathy for them, and you will reach out to them a helping hand. In the arms of your faith and love you will bring them to Christ. You will watch over and encourage them, and your sympathy and confidence will make it hard for them to fall from their steadfastness. In this work all the angels of heaven are ready to cooperate. All the resources of heaven are at the command of those who are seeking to save the lost. 
angels will help you to reach the most careless and the most hardened. And when one is brought back to God, all heaven is made glad. Seraphs and cherubs touch their golden harps, and sing praises to God and the Lamb for their mercy and loving kindness to the children of men. End of chapter 15「Chapter Sixteen of Christ's Object Lessons. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by J. L. Baldwin. Christ's Object Lessons by Ellen G. White. Chapter Sixteen Lost and Is Found. The parables of the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the prodigal son bring out in distinct lines God's pitying love for those who are straying from him. Although they have turned away from God, he does not leave them in their misery. He is full of kindness and tender pity toward all who are exposed to the temptations of the artful foe. In the parable of the prodigal son is presented the Lord's dealing with those who have once known the Father's love, but who have allowed the tempter to lead them captive at his will. A certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. And he divided unto them his living. And not many days after the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country. This younger son had become weary of the restraint of his father's house. He thought that his liberty was restricted. His father's love and care for him were misinterpreted, and he determined to follow the dictates of his own inclination. The youth acknowledges no obligation to his father and expresses no gratitude, yet he claims the privilege of a child in sharing his father's goods. The inheritance that would fall to him at his father's death he desires to receive now. He is bent on present enjoyment and cares not for the future. Having obtained his patrimony, he goes into a far country, away from his father's home. With money in plenty and liberty to do as he likes, he flatters himself that the desire of his heart is reached. There is no one to say, Do not do this, for it will be an injury to yourself, or Do this, because it is right. Evil companions help him to plunge ever deeper into sin, and he wastes his substance with riotous living. The Bible tells of men who, professing themselves to be wise, became fools, and this is the history of the young man of the parable. The wealth which he has selfishly claimed from his father he squanders upon harlots. The treasure of his young manhood is wasted. The precious years of life, the strength of intellect, the bright visions of youth, the spiritual aspirations, all are consumed in the fires of lust. A great famine arises, he begins to be in want, and he joins himself to a citizen of the country who sends him into the field to feed swine. To a Jew this was the most menial and degrading of employments. The youth who has boasted of his liberty now finds himself a slave. He is in the worst of bondage, holden with the cords of his sins. The glitter and tinsel that enticed him have disappeared, and he feels the burden of his chain. Sitting upon the ground in that desolate and famine-stricken land, with no companions but the swine, he is fain to fill himself with the husks on which the beasts are fed. Of the gay companions who flocked about him in his prosperous days, and ate and drank at his expense, there is not one left to befriend him. Where now is his riotous joy? Stilling his conscience, benumbing his sensibilities, he thought himself happy. But now, with money spent, with hunger unsatisfied, with pride humbled, with his moral nature dwarfed, with his will weak and untrustworthy, with his finer feelings seemingly dead, he is the most wretched of mortals. What a picture here of the sinner's state! Although surrounded with the blessings of his love, there is nothing that the sinner, bent on self-indulgence and sinful pleasure, desires so much as separation from God. Like the ungrateful son, he claims the good things of God as his by right. He takes them as a matter of course, and makes no return of gratitude, renders no service of love. As Cain went out from the presence of the Lord to seek his home, as the prodigal wandered into the far country, so do sinners seek happiness and forgetfulness of God. Whatever the appearance may be, every life centered in self is squandered. Whoever attempts to live apart from God is wasting his substance. He is squandering the precious years, squandering the powers of mind and heart and soul, and working to make himself bankrupt for eternity. The man who separates from God that he may serve himself is the slave of mammon. 
the mind that god created for the companionship of angels has become degraded to the service of that which is earthly and bestial this is the end to which self-serving tends if you have chosen such a life you know that you are spending money for that which is not bread and labor for that which satisfieth not there come to you hours when you realize your degradation alone in the far country you feel your misery and in despair you cry o oh, wretched man that i am who shall deliver me from the body of this death it is the statement of a universal truth which is contained in the prophet's words cursed be the man that trusteth in man and maketh flesh his arm and whose heart departeth from the lord for he shall be like a heath in the desert and shall not see when good cometh but shall inhabit the parched places in the wilderness in a salt land and not inhabited god maketh his sun to rise on the evil and on the good and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust but men have the power to shut themselves away from sunshine and shower so while the sun of righteousness shines and the showers of grace fall freely for all we may by separating ourselves from god still inhabit the parched places in the wilderness the love of god still yearns over the one who has chosen to separate from him and he sets in operation influences to bring him back to the father's house the prodigal son in his wretchedness came to himself the deceptive power that satan had exercised over him was broken he saw that his suffering was the result of his own folly and he said how many hired servants of my father's have bread enough and to spare and i perish with hunger i will arise and go to my father miserable as he was the prodigal found hope in the conviction of his father's love it was that love which was drawing him toward home so it is the assurance of god's love that constrains the sinner to return to god the goodness of god leadeth thee to repentance a golden chain the mercy and compassion of divine love is passed around every imperiled soul the lord declares i have loved thee with an everlasting love therefore with loving kindness have i drawn thee the son determines to confess his guilt he will go to his father saying i have sinned against heaven and before thee and am no more worthy to be called thy son but he adds showing how stinted is his conception of his father's love make me as one of thy hired servants the young man turns from the swine herds and the husks and sets his face toward home trembling with weakness and faint from hunger he presses eagerly on his way he has no covering to conceal his rags but his misery has conquered pride and he hurries on to beg a servant's place where he was once a child little did the gay thoughtless youth as he went out from his father's gate dream of the ache and longing left in that father's heart when he danced and feasted with his wild companions little did he think of the shadow that had fallen on his home and now as with weary and painful steps he pursues the homeward way he knows not that one is watching for his return but while he is yet a great way off the father discerns his form love is of quick sight not even the degradation of the years of sin can conceal the son from the father's eyes he had compassion and ran and fell on his neck in a long clinging tender embrace the father will permit no contemptuous eye to mock at his son's misery and tatters he takes from his own shoulders the broad rich mantle and wraps it around the son's wasted form and the youth sobs out his repentance saying father i have sinned against heaven and in thy sight and am no more worthy to be called thy son the father holds him close to his side and brings him home no opportunity is given him to ask a servant's place he is a son who shall be honored with the best the house affords and whom the waiting men and women shall respect and serve the father said to his servants bring forth the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring hither the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and be merry for this my son was dead and is alive again he was lost and is found and they began to be merry in his restless youth the prodigal looked upon his father as stern and severe how different his conception of him now so those who are deceived by satan look upon god as hard and exacting they regard him as watching to denounce and condemn as unwilling to receive the sinner so long as there is legal excuse for not helping him his law they regard as a restriction upon men's happiness a burdensome yoke from which they are glad to escape but he whose eyes have been opened by the love of christ will behold god as full of compassion 
he does not appear as a tyrannical relentless being but as a father longing to embrace his repenting son the sinner will exclaim with the psalmist like as a father pitieth his children so the lord pitieth them that fear him in the parable there is no taunting no casting up to the prodigal of his evil course the son feels that the past is forgiven and forgotten blotted out forever and so god says to the sinner i have blotted out as a thick cloud thy transgressions and as a cloud thy sins i will forgive their iniquity and i will remember their sin no more let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts and let him return unto the lord and he will have mercy upon him and to our god for he will abundantly pardon in those days and in that time saith the lord the iniquity of israel shall be sought for and there shall be none and the sins of judah and they shall not be found what assurance here of god's willingness to receive the repenting sinner have you reader chosen your own way have you wandered far from god have you sought to feast upon the fruits of transgression only to find them turn to ashes upon your lips and now your substance spent your life plans thwarted and your hopes dead do you sit alone and desolate now that voice which has long been speaking to your heart but to which you would not listen comes to you distinct and clear arise ye and depart for this is not your rest because it is polluted it shall destroy you even with a sore destruction return to your father's house he invites you saying return unto me for i have redeemed thee do not listen to the enemy's suggestion to stay away from christ until you have made yourself better until you are good enough to come to god if you wait until then you will never come when satan points to your filthy garments repeat the promise of jesus him that cometh to me i will in no wise cast out tell the enemy that the blood of jesus christ cleanses from all sin make the prayer of david your own purge me with hyssop and i shall be clean wash me and i shall be whiter than snow arise and go to your father he will meet you a great way off if you take even one step toward him in repentance he will hasten to enfold you in his arms of infinite love his ear is open to the cry of the contrite soul the very first reaching out of the heart after god is known to him never a prayer is offered however faltering never a tear is shed however secret never a sincere desire after god is cherished however feeble but the spirit of god goes forth to meet it even before the prayer is uttered or the yearning of the heart made known grace from christ goes forth to meet the grace that is working upon the human soul your heavenly father will take from you the garments defiled by sin in the beautiful parabolic prophecy of zechariah the high priest joshua standing clothed in filthy garments before the angel of the lord represents the sinner and the word is spoken by the lord take away the filthy garments from him and unto him he said behold i have caused thine iniquity to pass from thee and i will clothe thee with change of raiment so they set a fair mitre upon his head and clothed him with garments even so god will clothe you with the garments of salvation and cover you with the robe of righteousness though ye have lion among the pots yet shall ye be as the wings of a dove covered with silver and her feathers with yellow gold he will bring you into his banqueting house and his banner over you shall be love if thou wilt walk in my ways he declares i will give thee places to walk among these that stand by even among the holy angels that surround his throne as the bridegroom rejoiceth over the bride so shall thy god rejoice over thee he will save he will rejoice over thee with joy he will rest in his love he will joy over thee with singing and heaven and earth shall unite in the father's song of rejoicing for this my son was dead and is alive again he was lost and is found thus far in the saviour's parable there is no discordant note to jar the harmony of the scene of joy but now christ introduces another element when the prodigal came home the elder son was in the field and as he came and drew nigh to the house he heard music and dancing and he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant and he said unto him thy brother is come and thy father hath killed the fatted calf because he hath received him safe and sound and he was angry and would not go in this elder brother has not been sharing in his father's anxiety and watching for the one that was lost he shares not therefore in the father's joy at the wanderer's return the sounds of rejoicing kindle no gladness in his heart 
he inquires of a servant the reason of the festivity and the answer excites his jealousy he will not go in to welcome his lost brother the favor shown to the prodigal he regards as an insult to himself when the father comes out to remonstrate with him the pride and malignity of his nature are revealed he dwells upon his own life in his father's house as a round of unrequited service and then places in mean contrast the favor shown to the son just returned he makes it plain that his own service has been that of a servant rather than a son when he should have found an abiding joy in his father's presence his mind has rested upon the profit to accrue from his circumspect life his words show that it is for this he has forgone the pleasures of sin now if this brother is to share in the father's gifts the elder son counts that he himself has been wronged he grudges his brother the favor shown him he plainly shows that had he been in the father's place he would not have received the prodigal he does not even acknowledge him as a brother but coldly speaks of him as thy son yet the father deals tenderly with him son he says thou art ever with me and all that i have is thine through all these years of your brother's outcast life have you not had the privilege of companionship with me everything that could minister to the happiness of his children was freely theirs the son need have no question of gift or reward all that i have is thine you have only to believe my love and take the gift that is freely bestowed one son had for a time cut himself off from the household not discerning the father's love but now he has returned and the tide of joy sweeps away every disturbing thought this thy brother was dead and is alive again and was lost and is found was the elder brother brought to see his own mean ungrateful spirit did he come to see that though his brother had done wickedly he was his brother still did the elder brother repent of his jealousy and hard-heartedness concerning this christ was silent for the parable was still enacting and it rested with his hearers to determine what the outcome should be by the elder son were represented the unrepenting jews of christ's day and also the pharisees in every age who look with contempt upon those whom they regard as publicans and sinners because they themselves have not gone to great excesses in vice they are filled with self-righteousness christ met these cavillers on their own ground like the elder son in the parable they had enjoyed special privileges from god they claimed to be sons in god's house but they had the spirit of the hireling they were working not from love but from hope of reward in their eyes god was an exacting taskmaster they saw christ inviting publicans and sinners to receive freely the gift of his grace the gift which the rabbis hoped to secure only by toil and penance and they were offended the prodigal's return which filled the father's heart with joy only stirred them to jealousy in the parable the father's remonstrance with the elder son was heaven's tender appeal to the pharisees all that i have is thine not as wages but as a gift like the prodigal you can receive it only as the unmerited bestowal of the father's love self-righteousness not only leads men to misrepresent god but makes them cold-hearted and critical toward their brethren the elder son in his selfishness and jealousy stood ready to watch his brother to criticize every action and to accuse him for the least deficiency he would detect every mistake and make the most of every wrong act thus he would seek to justify his own unforgiving spirit many today are doing the same thing while the soul is making its very first struggles against a flood of temptations they stand by stubborn self-willed complaining accusing they may claim to be children of god but they are acting out the spirit of satan by their attitude toward their brethren these accusers place themselves where god cannot give them the light of his countenance many are constantly questioning wherewith shall i come before the lord and bow myself before the high god shall i come before him with burnt offerings with calves of a year old will the lord be pleased with thousands of rams or with ten thousands of rivers of oil but he hath shown thee o man what is good and what doth the lord require of thee but to do justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with thy god this is the service that god has chosen to loose the bands of wickedness to undo the heavy burdens and to let the oppressed go free and that ye break every yoke and that thou hide not thyself from thine own flesh when you see yourselves as sinners saved only by the love of your heavenly father you will have tender pity for others who are suffering in sin 
you will no longer meet misery and repentance with jealousy and censure when the ice of selfishness is melted from your hearts you will be in sympathy with god and will share his joy in the saving of the lost it is true that you claim to be a child of god but if this claim be true it is thy brother that was dead and is alive again and was lost and is found he is bound to you by the closest ties for god recognizes him as a son deny your relationship to him and you show that you are but a hireling in the household not a child in the family of god though you will not join in the greeting to the lost the joy will go on the restored one will have his place by the father's side and in the father's work he that is forgiven much the same loves much but you will be in the darkness without for he that loveth not knoweth not god for god is love end of chapter sixteen chapter seventeen of christ's object lessons this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by J.L. Baldwin. Christ's Object Lessons by Ellen G. White. Chapter 17. Spare it this year also. Christ, in his teaching, linked with the warning of judgment the invitation of mercy. The Son of Man is not come, he said, to destroy men's lives, but to save them. God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. His mission of mercy, in its relation to God's justice and judgment, is illustrated in the parable of the barren fig tree. Christ had been warning the people of the coming of the kingdom of God, and he had sharply rebuked their ignorance and indifference. The signs in the sky which foretold the weather they were quick to read, but the signs of the times which so clearly pointed to his mission were not discerned. But men were as ready then as men are now to conclude that they themselves are the favorites of heaven and that the message of reproof is meant for another. The hearers told Jesus of an event which had just caused great excitement. Some of the measures of Pontius Pilate, the governor of Judea, had given offense to the people. There had been a popular tumult in Jerusalem, and Pilate had attempted to quell this by violence. On one occasion his soldiers had even invaded the precincts of the temple, and had cut down some Galilean pilgrims in the very act of slaying their sacrifices. The Jews regarded calamity as a judgment on account of the sufferer's sin, and those who told of this act of violence did so with secret satisfaction. In their view, their own good fortune proved them to be much better, and therefore more favored by God, than were these Galileans. They expected to hear from Jesus words of condemnation for these men, who, they doubted not, richly deserved their punishment. The disciples of Christ did not venture to express their ideas until they had heard the opinion of their master. He had given them pointed lessons in reference to judging other men's characters, and measuring retribution according to their finite judgment. Yet they looked for Christ to denounce these men as sinners above others. Great was their surprise at his answer. Turning to the multitude, the Saviour said, Suppose ye that these Galileans were sinners above all the Galileans because they suffered such things? I tell you nay, but except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. These startling calamities were designed to lead them to humble their hearts and to repent of their sins. The storm of vengeance was gathering, which was soon to burst upon all who had not found a refuge in Christ. As Jesus talked with the disciples and the multitude, he looked forward with prophetic glance and saw Jerusalem besieged with armies. He heard the tramp of the aliens marching against the chosen city, and saw the thousands upon thousands perishing in the siege. Many of the Jews were, like those Galileans, slain in the temple courts in the very act of offering sacrifice. The calamities that had fallen upon individuals were warnings from God to a nation equally guilty. Except ye repent, said Jesus, ye shall all likewise perish. For a little time the day of probation lingered for them. There was still time for them to know the things that belonged to their peace. A certain man, he continued, had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came and sought fruit thereon and found none. Then said he unto the dresser of his vineyard, Behold, these three years I come seeking fruit on this fig tree and find none. Cut it down. Why cumbereth it the ground? Christ's hearers could not misunderstand the application of his words. 
David had sung of Israel as the vine brought out of Egypt. Isaiah had written, The vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah his pleasant plant. The generation to whom the Savior had come were represented by the fig tree in the Lord's vineyard, within the circle of his special care and blessing. God's purpose toward his people and the glorious possibilities before them had been set forth in the beautiful words, that they might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. The dying Jacob, under the spirit of inspiration, had said of his best-loved son, Joseph is a fruitful bough, even a fruitful bough by a well, whose branches run over the wall. And he said, The God of thy father shall help thee, the Almighty shall bless thee with blessings of heaven above, blessings of the deep that lieth under. So God had planted Israel as a goodly vine by the wells of life. He had made it his vineyard in a very fruitful hill. He had fenced it and gathered out the stones thereof and planted it with the choicest vine. And he looked that it should bring forth grapes, and it brought forth wild grapes. The people of Christ's day made a greater show of piety than did the Jews of earlier ages, but they were even more destitute of the sweet graces of the Spirit of God. The precious fruits of character that made the life of Joseph so fragrant and beautiful were not manifest in the Jewish nation. God and his son had been seeking fruit and had found none. Israel was a cumberer of the ground. Its very existence was a curse, for it filled the place in the vineyard that a fruitful tree might fill. It robbed the world of the blessings that God had designed to give. The Israelites had misrepresented God among the nations. They were not merely useless, but a decided hindrance. To a great degree their religion was misleading, and wrought ruin instead of salvation. In the parable the dresser of the vineyard does not question the sentence that the tree, if it remained fruitless, should be cut down. But he knows and shares the owner's interest in that barren tree. Nothing could give him greater joy than to see its growth and fruitfulness. He responds to the desire of the owner, saying, Let it alone this year also, till I shall dig about it and dung it, and if it bear fruit, well. The gardener does not refuse to minister to so unpromising a plant. He stands ready to give it still greater care. He will make its surroundings most favorable, and will lavish upon it every attention. The owner and the dresser of the vineyard are one in their interest in the fig tree. So the father and the son were one in their love for the chosen people. Christ was saying to his hearers that increased opportunities would be given them. Every means that the love of God could devise would be put in operation that they might become trees of righteousness, bringing forth fruit for the blessing of the world. Jesus did not in the parable tell the result of the gardener's work. At that point his story was cut short. Its conclusion rested with the generation that heard his words. To them the solemn warning was given, If not, then after that thou shalt cut it down. Upon them it depended whether the irrevocable words should be spoken. The day of wrath was near. In the calamities that had already befallen Israel, the owner of the vineyard was mercifully forewarning them of the destruction of the unfruitful tree. The warning sounds down along the line to us in this generation. Are you, O careless heart, a fruitless tree in the Lord's vineyard? Shall the words of doom ere long be spoken of you? How long have you received his gifts? How long has he watched and waited for a return of love? Planted in his vineyard under the watchful care of the gardener, what privileges are yours? How often has the tender gospel message thrilled your heart? You have taken the name of Christ. You are outwardly a member of the church which is his body. And yet you are conscious of no living connection with the great heart of love. The tide of his life does not flow through you. The sweet graces of his character, the fruits of the Spirit, are not seen in your life. The barren tree receives the rain and the sunshine in the gardener's care. It draws nourishment from the soil but its unproductive boughs only darken the ground, so that fruit-bearing plants cannot flourish in its shadow. So God's gifts, lavished on you, convey no blessing to the world. You are robbing others of privileges that, but for you, might be theirs. You realize, though it may be but dimly, that you are a cumberer of the ground. Yet in his great mercy God has not cut you down. He does not look coldly upon you. He does not turn away with indifference or leave you to destruction. Looking upon you, he cries, as he cried so many centuries ago concerning Israel, How shall I give thee up, Ephraim? How shall I deliver thee, Israel? I will not execute the fierceness of mine anger. 
I will not return to destroy Ephraim, for I am God and not man. The pitying Savior is saying concerning you, Spare it this year also, till I shall dig about it and dress it. With what unwearied love did Christ minister to Israel during the period of added probation? Upon the cross he prayed, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. After his ascension, the gospel was preached first at Jerusalem. There the Holy Spirit was poured out. There the first gospel church revealed the power of the risen Savior. There Stephen, his face as it had been the face of an angel, bore his testimony and laid down his life. All that heaven itself could give was bestowed. What could have been done more to my vineyard, Christ said, that I have not done in it? So his care and labor for you are not lessened, but increased. Still, he says, I the Lord do keep it. I will water it every moment, lest any hurt it. I will keep it night and day. If it bear fruit, well, and if not, then after that... The heart that does not respond to divine agencies becomes hardened until it is no longer susceptible to the influence of the Holy Spirit. Then it is that the word is spoken, cut it down, why cumbereth it the ground? Today he invites you, O Israel, return unto the Lord thy God, I will heal their backsliding, I will love them freely, I will be as the dew unto Israel, he shall grow as the lily, and cast forth his roots as Lebanon. They that dwell under his shadow shall return. They shall revive as the corn and grow as the vine. From me is thy fruit found. End of chapter 17。Chapter 18 of Christ's Object Lessons。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Christ Object Lessons by Ellen G. White. Chapter 18 Go into the Highways and Hedges. The Savior was a guest at the feast of a Pharisee. He accepted invitations from the rich as well as the poor, and According to his custom, he linked the scene before him with his lessons of truth. Among the Jews, the sacred feast was connected with all their seasons of national and religious rejoicing. It was to them a type of the blessings of eternal life. The great feast at which they were to sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, while the Gentiles stood without, and looked on with longing eyes, was a theme on which they delighted to dwell. The lesson of warning and instruction which Christ desired to give, he now illustrated by the parable of a great supper. The blessings of God, both for the present and for the future life, the Jews thought to shut up to themselves. They denied God's mercy to the Gentiles. By the parable, Christ showed that they were themselves, at that very time, rejecting the invitation of mercy, the call to God's kingdom. He showed that the invitation which they had slighted was to be sent to those whom they despised, those from whom they had drawn away their garments, as if they were lepers to be shunned. In choosing the guests for his feast, the Pharisee had consulted his own selfish interest. Christ said to him, when thou makest a dinner or a supper, call not thy friends, nor thy brethren, neither thy kinsmen, nor thy rich neighbors, lest they also bid thee again, and a recompense be made thee. But when thou makest a feast, call the poor, the maimed, the lame, the blind, and thou shalt be blessed, for they cannot recompense thee, for thou shalt be recompensed at the resurrection of the just. Christ was here repeating the instruction he had given to Israel through Moses. At their sacred feasts, the Lord had directed that the stranger and the fatherless and the widow which are within thy gates shall come and shall eat and be satisfied. These gatherings were to be as object lessons to Israel. Being thus taught the joy of true hospitality, the people were throughout the year to care for the bereaved and the poor. And these feasts had a wider lesson. The spiritual blessings given to Israel were not for themselves alone. God had given the bread of life to them. 
that they might break it to the world. This work they had not fulfilled. Christ's words were a rebuke to their selfishness. To the Pharisees, his words were distasteful. Hoping to turn the conversation into another channel, one of them, with a sanctimonious air, exclaimed, Blessed is he that shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. This man spoke with great assurance, as if he himself were certain of a place in the kingdom. His attitude was similar to the attitude of those who rejoice that they are saved by Christ, when they do not comply with the conditions upon which salvation is promised. His spirit was like that of Balaam when he prayed, Let me die the death of the righteous, and let my last end be like his. The Pharisee was not thinking of his own fitness for heaven, but of what he hoped to enjoy in heaven. His remark was designed to turn away the minds of the guests at the feast from the subject of their practical duty. He thought to carry them past the present life to the remote time of the resurrection of the just. Christ read the heart of the pretender, and, fastening his eyes upon him, he opened before the company the character and value of their present privileges. He showed them that they had a part to act at that very time in order to share in the blessedness of the future. A certain man, he said, made a great supper and bade many. When the time of the feast arrived, the host sent his servant to the expected guests with the second message. Come, for all things are now ready but a strange indifference was shown. All with one consent began to make excuse. The first said unto him, I have bought a piece of ground, and I must needs go and see it. I pray thee, have me excused. And another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen, and I go to prove them. I pray thee, have me excused. And another said, I have married a wife, and therefore I cannot come none of the excuses were founded on a real necessity the man who must needs go and see his piece of ground had already purchased it his haste to go and see it was due to the fact that his interest was absorbed in his purchase the oxen too had been bought the proving of them was only to satisfy the interest of the buyer the third excuse had no more semblance of reason the fact that the intended guest had married a wife need not have prevented his presence at the feast. His wife also would have been made welcome, but he had his own plans for enjoyment, and these seemed to him more desirable than the feast he had promised to attend. He had learned to find pleasure in other society than that of the host. He did not ask to be excused, made not even a pretense of courtesy in his refusal. The I cannot was only a veil for the truth. I do not care to come. All the excuses betray a preoccupied mind. To these intended guests, other interests had become all-absorbing. The invitation they had pledged themselves to accept was put aside, and the generous friend was insulted by their indifference. By the great supper, Christ represents the blessings offered through the gospel. The provision is nothing less than Christ himself. He is the bread that comes down from heaven, and from him the streams of salvation flow. The Lord's messengers had proclaimed to the Jews the advent of the Savior. They had pointed to Christ as the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. In the feast he had provided, God offered to them the greatest gift that heaven can bestow, a gift that is beyond computation. The love of God had furnished the costly banquet, and had provided inexhaustible resources. If any man eat of this bread, Christ said, he shall live forever. But in order to accept the invitation to the gospel feast, they must make their worldly interests subordinate to the one purpose of receiving Christ and his righteousness. God gave all for man, and he asked him to place his service above every earthly and selfish consideration. He cannot accept a divided heart. The heart that is absorbed in earthly affections cannot be given up to God. The lesson is for all time. We are to follow the Lamb of God whithersoever he goeth. His guidance is to be chosen, 
and its companionship valued above the companionship of earthly friends christ says he that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me and he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me around the family board when breaking their daily bread many in christ's day repeated the words blessed is he that shall eat bread in the kingdom of god but christ showed how difficult it was to find guests for the table provided at infinite cost those who listened to his words knew that they had slighted the invitation of mercy to them worldly possessions riches and pleasures were all absorbing with one consent they had made excuse so it is now the excuses urged for refusing the invitation to the feast cover the whole ground of excuses for refusing the gospel invitation men declare that they cannot imperil their worldly prospects by giving attention to the claims of the gospel they count their temporal interests as of more value than the things of eternity the very blessings they have received from god become a barrier to separate their souls from their creator and redeemer they will not be interrupted in their worldly pursuits and they say to the messenger of mercy go thy way for this time when i have a convenient season i will call for thee others urge the difficulties that would arise in their social relations should they obey the call of god they say they cannot afford to be out of harmony with their relatives and acquaintances thus they prove themselves to be the very actors described in the parable the master of the feast regards their flimsy excuses as showing contempt for his invitation the man who said i have married a wife and therefore i cannot come represents a large class many there are who will allow their wives or their husbands to prevent them from heeding the call of god the husband says i cannot obey my convictions of duty while my wife is opposed to it her influence would make it exceedingly hard for me to do so the wife hears the gracious call come for all things are now ready and she says i pray thee have me excused my husband refuses the invitation of mercy he says that his business stands in the way i must go with my husband and therefore i cannot come the children's hearts are impressed they desire to come but they love their father and mother and since these do not heed the gospel call the children think that they cannot be expected to come they too say have me excused all these refuse the saviour's call because they fear division in the family circle they suppose that in refusing to obey god they are ensuring the peace and prosperity of the home but this is a delusion those who sow selfishness will reap selfishness in rejecting the love of christ they reject that which alone can impart purity and steadfastness to human love they will not only lose heaven but will fail of the true enjoyment of that for which heaven was sacrificed in the parable the giver of the feast learned how his invitation had been treated and being angry said to his servant go out quickly into the streets and the lanes of the city and bring in hither the poor and the maimed and the halt and the blind the host turned from those who despised his bounty and invited a class who were not full who were not in possession of houses and lands he invited those who were poor and hungry and who would appreciate the bounties provided the publicans and the harlots christ said go into the kingdom of god before you however wretched be the specimens of humanity that men spurn and turn aside from they are not too low too wretched for the notice and love of god christ longs to have careworn weary oppressed human beings come to him he longs to give them the light and joy and peace that are to be found nowhere else the various sinners are the objects of his deep earnest pity and love he sends his holy spirit to yearn over them with tenderness seeking to draw them to himself the servant who brought in the poor and the blind reported to his master it is done as thou hast commanded and yet there is room and the lord said unto the servant go out into the highways and hedges and compel them to come in 
that my house may be filled here christ pointed to the work of the gospel outside the pale of judaism in the highways and byways of the world in obedience to this command paul and barnabas declared to the jews it is necessary that the word of god should first have been spoken to you but seeing ye put it from you and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life lo we turn to the gentiles for so hath the lord commanded us saying i have set thee to be a light of the gentiles that thou shouldest be for salvation unto the ends of the earth and when the gentiles heard this they were glad and glorified the word of the lord and as many as were ordained to eternal life believed the gospel message proclaimed by christ's disciples was the announcement of its first advent to the world it bore to men the good tidings of salvation through faith in him it pointed forward to his second coming in glory to redeem his people and it set before men the hope through faith and obedience of sharing the inheritance of the saints in light this message is given to men today and at this time there is coupled with it the announcement of christ's second coming as at hand the signs which he himself gave of his coming have been fulfilled and by the teaching of god's word we may know that the lord is at the door john in the revelation foretells the proclamation of the gospel message just before christ's second coming he beholds an angel flying in the midst of heaven having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people saying with a loud voice fear god and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment is come in the prophecy this warning of the judgment with its connected messages is followed by the coming of the son of man in the clouds of heaven the proclamation of the judgment is an announcement of christ's second coming as at hand and this proclamation is called the everlasting gospel thus the preaching of christ's second coming the announcement of its nearness is shown to be an essential part of the gospel message the bible declares that in the last days men will be absorbed in worldly pursuits in pleasure and money-getting they will be blind to eternal realities christ says as the days of noah were so shall also the coming of the son of man be for as in the days that were before the flood they were eating and drinking marrying and giving in marriage until the day that noah entered into the ark and knew not until the flood came and took them all away so shall also the coming of the son of man be so it is today men are rushing on in the chase for gain and selfish indulgence as if there were no god no heaven and no hereafter in noah's day the warning of the flood was sent to startle men in their wickedness and call them to repentance so the message of christ's soon coming is designed to arouse men from their absorption in worldly things it is intended to awaken them to a sense of eternal realities that they may give heed to the invitation to the lord's table the gospel invitation is to be given to all the world to every nation and kindred and tongue and people the last message of warning and mercy is to lighten the whole earth with its glory it is to reach all classes of men rich and poor high and low go out into the highways and hedges christ says and compel them to come in that my house may be filled the world is perishing for want of the gospel there is a famine for the word of god there are few who preach the word unmixed with human tradition though men have the bible in their hands they do not receive the blessing that god has placed in it for them the lord calls upon his servants to carry his message to the people the word of everlasting life must be given to those who are perishing in their sins in the command to go into the highways and hedges christ sets forth the work of all whom he calls to minister in his name the whole world is the field for christ's ministers the whole human family is comprised in their congregation the lord desires that his word of grace shall be brought home to every soul to a great degree 
this must be accomplished by personal labor this was christ's method his work was largely made up of personal interviews he had a faithful regard for the one sole audience through that one soul the message was often extended to thousands we are not to wait for souls to come to us we must seek them out where they are when the word has been preached in the pulpit the word has but just begun there are multitudes who will never be reached by the gospel unless it is carried to them the invitation to the feast was first given to the jewish people the people who have been called to stand as teachers and leaders among men the people in whose hands were the prophetic scrolls for telling christ's advent and to whom was committed the symbolic service foreshadowing his mission had priests and people heeded the call they would have united with christ's messengers in giving the gospel invitation to the world the truth was sent to them that they might impart it when they refused the call it was sent to the poor the maimed the halt and the blind publicans and sinners received the invitation when the gospel call is sent to the gentiles there is the same plan of working the message is first to be given in the highways to men who have an active part in the world's work to the teachers and leaders of the people let the lord's messengers bear this in mind to the shepherds of the flock the teachers divinely appointed it should come as a word to be heeded those who belong to the higher ranks of society are to be sought out with tender affection and brotherly regard men in business life in high positions of trust men with large inventive faculties and scientific insight men of genius teachers of the gospel whose minds have not been called to the special truths for this time these should be the first to hear the call to them the invitation must be given there is work to be done for the wealthy they need to be awakened to their responsibility as those entrusted with the gifts of heaven they need to be reminded that they must give an account to him who shall judge the living and the dead the wealthy man needs your labor in the love and fear of god too often he trusts in his riches and feels not his danger the eyes of his mind need to be attracted to things of enduring value he needs to recognize the authority of true goodness which says come unto me all ye that labor and are heavy laden and i will give you rest take my yoke upon you and learn of me for i am meek and lowly in heart and ye shall find rest unto your souls for my yoke is easy and my burden is light those who stand high in the world for their education wealth or calling are seldom addressed personally in regard to the interests of the soul many christian workers hesitate to approach these classes but this should not be if a man were drowning we would not stand by and see him perish because he was a lawyer a merchant or a judge if we saw persons rushing over a precipice we would not hesitate to urge them back whatever might be their position or calling neither should we hesitate to warn men of the peril of the soul none should be neglected because of their apparent devotion to worldly things many in high social positions are heart sore and sick of vanity they are longing for a peace which they have not in the very highest ranks of society are those who are hungering and thirsting for salvation many would receive help if the lord's workers would approach them personally with a kind manner a heart made tender by the love of christ the success of the gospel message does not depend upon learned speeches eloquent testimonies or deep arguments it depends on the simplicity of the message and its adaptation to the souls that are hungering for the bread of life what shall i do to be saved that is the want of the soul thousands can be reached in the most simple and humble way the most intellectual those who are looked upon as the world's most gifted men and women are often refreshed by the simple words of one who loves god and who can speak of that love as naturally as the worldling speaks of the things that interest him most deeply often the words well prepared and studied have but little influence but the true honest expression of a son or daughter of god spoken in natural simplicity 
has power to unbolt the door to hearts that have long been closed against christ and his love let the worker for christ remember that he is not to labor in his own strength let him lay hold of the throne of god with faith in his power to save let him wrestle with god in prayer and then work with all the facilities god has given him the holy spirit is provided as his efficiency ministering angels will be by his side to impress hearts if the leaders and teachers at jerusalem had received the truth christ brought what a missionary center their city would have been backslidden israel would have been converted a vast army would have been gathered for the lord and how rapidly they could have carried the gospel to all parts of the world so now if men of influence and large capacity for usefulness could be won for christ then through them what a work could be accomplished in lifting up the fallen gathering in the outcasts and spreading far and wide the tidings of salvation rapidly the invitation might be given and the guests be gathered for the lord's table but we are not to think only of great and gifted men to the neglect of the poorer classes christ instructs his messengers to go also to those in the byways and hedges to the poor and lowly of the earth in the courts and lanes of the great city in the lowly byways of the country our families and individuals perhaps strangers in a strange land who are without church relations and who in their loneliness come to feel that god has forgotten them they do not understand what they must do to be saved many are sunken in sin many are in distress they are pressed with suffering want unbelief despondency disease of every type afflicts them both in body and in soul they long to find a solace for their troubles and satan tempts them to seek it in lusts and pleasures that lead to ruin and death he is offering them the apples of sodom that will turn to ashes upon their lips they are spending their money for that which is not bread and their labor for that which satisfieth not in these suffering ones we are to see those whom christ came to save his invitation to them is ho oh, every one that thirsteth come ye to the waters and he that hath no money come ye buy and eat yea come buy wine and milk without money and without price hearken diligently unto me and eat ye that which is good and let your soul delight itself in fatness incline your ear and come unto me hear and your soul shall live god has given a special command that we should regard the stranger the outcast and the poor souls who are weak in moral power many who appear wholly indifferent to religious things are in heart longing for rest and peace although they may have sunken to the very depths of sin there is a possibility of saving them christ's servants are to follow his example as he went from place to place he comforted the suffering and healed the sick then he placed before them the great truths in regard to his kingdom this is the work of his followers as you relieve the sufferings of the body you will find ways for ministering to the wants of the soul you can point to the uplifted savior and tell of the love of the great physician who alone has power to restore tell the poor desponding ones who have gone astray that they need not despair though they have erred and have not been building the right character god has joy to restore them even the joy of his salvation he delights to take apparently hopeless material those through whom satan has worked and make them the subjects of his grace he rejoices to deliver them from the wrath which is to fall upon the disobedient tell them there is healing cleansing for every soul there is a place for them at the lord's table he is waiting to bid them welcome those who go into the byways and hedges will find others of a widely different character who need their ministry there are those who are living up to all the light they have and are serving god the best they know how but they realize that there is a great work to be done for themselves and for those about them they are longing for an increased knowledge of god but they have only begun to see the glimmering of greater light they are praying with tears that god will send them the blessing which by faith they discern afar off 
in the midst of the wickedness of the great cities many of these souls are to be found many of them are in very humble circumstances and because of this they are unnoticed by the world there are many of whom ministers and churches know nothing but in lowly miserable places they are the lord's witnesses they may have had little light and few opportunities for christian training but in the midst of nakedness hunger and cold they are seeking to minister to others let the stewards of the manifold grace of god seek out these souls visit their homes and through the power of the holy spirit minister to their needs study the bible with them and pray with them with that simplicity which the holy spirit inspires christ will give his servants a message that will be as the bread of heaven to the soul the precious blessing will be carried from heart to heart from family to family the command given in the parable to compel them to come in has often been misinterpreted it has been regarded as teaching that we should force men to receive the gospel but it denotes rather the urgency of the invitation and the effectiveness of the inducements presented the gospel never employs force in bringing men to christ its message is ho oh, every one that thirsteth come ye to the waters the spirit and the bride say come and whosoever will let him take the water of life freely the power of god's love and grace constrains us to come the saviour says behold i stand at the door and knock if any man hear my voice and open the door i will come in to him and will sup with him and he with me he is not repulsed by scorn or turned aside by threatening but continually seeks the lost one saying how shall i give thee up although his love is driven back by the stubborn heart he returns to plead with greater force behold i stand at the door and knock the winning power of his love compels souls to come in and to christ they say thy gentleness hath made me great christ will impart to his messengers the same yearning love that he himself has in seeking for the lost we are not merely to say come there are those who will hear the call but their ears are too dull to take in its meaning their eyes are too blind to see anything good in store for them many realize their great degradation they say i am not fit to be helped leave me alone but the workers must not desist in tender pitying love lay hold of the discouraged and helpless ones give them your courage your hope your strength by kindness compel them to come of some have compassion making a difference and others save with fear pulling them out of the fire if the servants of god will walk with him in faith he will give power to their message they will be enabled so to present his love and the danger of rejecting the grace of god that men will be constrained to accept the gospel christ will perform wonderful miracles if men will but do their god-given part in human hearts today, as great a transformation may be wrought as has ever been wrought in generations past john bunyan was redeemed from profanity and revelling john newton from slave dealing to proclaim an uplifted saviour a bunyan and a newton may be redeemed from among men to-day through human agents who cooperate with the divine many a poor outcast will be reclaimed and in his turn will seek to restore the image of god in man there are those who have had very meagre opportunities who have walked in ways of error because they knew no better way to whom beams of light will come as the word of christ came to zacchaeus today i must abide at thy house so the word will come to them and those who were supposed to be hardened sinners will be found to have hearts as tender as a child's because christ has deigned to notice them many will come from the grossest error and sin and will take the place of others who have had opportunities and privileges but have not prized them they will be accounted the chosen of god elect precious and when christ shall come into his kingdom they will stand next his throne but see that ye refuse not him that speaketh jesus said none of those men which were bidden shall taste of my supper 
they had rejected the invitation and none of them were to be invited again in rejecting christ the jews were hardening their hearts and giving themselves into the power of satan so that it would be impossible for them to accept his grace so it is now if the love of god is not appreciated and does not become an abiding principle to soften and subdue the soul we are utterly lost the lord can give no greater manifestation of his love than he has given if the love of jesus does not subdue the heart there are no means by which we can be reached every time you refuse to listen to the message of mercy you strengthen yourself in unbelief every time you fail to open the door of your heart to christ you become more and more unwilling to listen to the voice of him that speaketh you diminish your chance of responding to the last appeal of mercy let it not be written of you as of ancient israel ephraim is joined to idols let him alone let not christ weep over you as he wept over jerusalem saying how often would i have gathered thy children together as a hen doth gather her brood under her wings and you would not behold your house is left unto you desolate we are living in a time when the last message of mercy the last invitation is sounding to the children of men the command go out into the highways and hedges is reaching its final fulfillment to every soul christ's invitation will be given the messengers are saying come for all things are now ready heavenly angels are still working in cooperation with human agencies the holy spirit is presenting every inducement to constrain you to come christ is watching for some sign that will betoken the removing of the bolts and the opening of the door of your heart for his entrance angels are waiting to bear the tidings to heaven that another lost sinner has been found the hosts of heaven are waiting ready to strike their harps and to sing a song of rejoicing that another soul has accepted the invitation to the gospel feast end of chapter eighteen